mic one, two, three. Testing one, two, three, four, five. This is a mic test for the. Can you guys hear it? Back. Can I hear it, Lolita? One, two, three, four, five. Okay.
co-hosts, um, Senators Heidi Heitkamp and Dick Durbin, who have introduced legislation, the Trauma-Informed Care Act for Children and Families, um, th that really helps us to think about how we can uh, uh, create more trauma-informed programs across our country, as well as working smarter with some of the resources that are already funded in our communities and that would help us to facilitate and coordinate uh, across various agencies. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a primer on, on this issue, and as soon as I can figure out how to use this. There you go. So when we talk about adversity in our communities, there's a number of different faces of adversity. So you'll hear from, uh, from Kana Inamono from SAMHSA, who's gonna talk about a lot of the mental health um, issues as well as some of the substance abuse issues that really are at the heart of some of the adversities that we see in our communities. When we talk about the opioid crisis, it's not just a point in time in one individual. There are consequences for that individual, for that family, for that community. Just to give you an example, when we're talking about an individual who's ex who is uh, addicted to various opioids, that individual is in the context of a family. As a result of that, in Ohio alone, you have 7,000 children who are now in foster care, protective foster care, um, because of the opioid crisis. That is just one state, one snapshot. As you can see here, this graph just shows you the numbers through 2014 of the number of op opioid deaths and how that trend has actually gone exponentially over a 14-year period, 14 period of time. The orange line are the male deaths that are attributed to opioid deaths, uh, opioids, and the yellow line is females. That number is actually, that gap is actually closing. So again, when we talk about how ACEs, how abuse issues in our, in our communities are pervasive, again, we're seeing this gap that is closing between gender, between economics levels, as well as education levels. Yeah, if you can advance for me, <laughs> okay. So, so what does that look like in the heartland? Why are the senators so interested in this? Well, this is something that is affecting them at home. At Senator Heitkamp's in her own home state, Native Americans are dying at an overdose rate that is two and three times the rate of African Americans and Latinos. And in just in Southwest North Dakota, 40% of children are in protective foster care because of their parental, their parents' substance abuse. So this is a real issue that is hitting at home for, for these senators. Next slide. So in, and what does this look like in Illinois? It may shock you to learn that despite the headlines that, talk, that we hear about Chicago and the amount of gun violence deaths there, that opioid abuse deaths actually outrank all gun-related deaths in that state. So we're talking about means by homicide, suicide, as well as accidental deaths due to gunfire. So that, there again kind of speaks to the pervasiveness of just one issue, one adversity that we're looking at, but how it cuts across and actually outranks the number of issues that we have in community. Also, thinking about other systems and how they're impacted, when you look at the health care costs in Illinois alone, in, this, in the state of Illinois, you had in 2015, the health care costs that were associated with opioid abuse were nearly a billion dollars. Next slide. So when we look at childhood poverty and the factors that are associated with childhood poverty, we know that those factors are also associated with um, adverse childhood experiences. So thinking about homelessness, food insecurity, unemployment, and underemployment, these are things that are contextual to a child's environment or their family environment, but have real effects on their development. So when you have a family that is under these types of crises that are occurring within their community or their family, a lot of times these things will absolutely affect a child's health and well-being. They can present as a mother's maternal depression, and that depression itself impacts the way that the child's brain architecture will grow, and we'll hear more about that later. But then also thinking about some of the learning delays that we see in the educational environment, thinking about the mental illness that occurs in, within families that are at a higher rate of those families that are living in poverty, but also some of the substance abuse issues, as I illustrated earlier. It's important to remember that if a child is not coming to school ready to learn, that that is, that is leading to other developmental uh, delays that other systems then have to pay. So again, 
again, it's not just looking at that snapshot in time from a healthcare cost or a bit of an emotional cost to a family, but there are other systems that are involved. And you'll hear about that from the juvenile justice system from Judge, from Judge Michael, um, uh, I'm sorry, yes, Judge Michael, and a bit here. Next slide. So we're also gonna to touch on violence and its, um, its impact on children. So this chart here shows the incidence of violence. The blue lines are the singular incident of violence to a child's exposure, um, just those that were victimized in just one year. So looking at all types of physical abuse, assault, sexual assault, as well as um, looking at other family violence. And so the blue line indicates that one singular incidence of assault. So we're going to pause here. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we are so happy to have you here. So thank you, Senator Heitkamp. First off, I want to tell you how grateful I am to see all of you in these chairs. Um, we're, as I've said before in these briefings, we're trying to build an army. And the easiest way to build an army is to um, uh, build situational awareness about the cause and what it is that we're trying to do. But I think more than almost anything that we're doing in child welfare today, this is something that's hopeful. You're going to hear horrible statistics, as you're already seeing when childhood poverty, exposure to violence. So, 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 so the environmental scan that we might do today on what's happening with America's children um, is depressing. There's just no way about it. And I'm going to give you, I'm just going to read a couple slides out of a, a document that my, uh, uh, my um, elementary principals just brought with them, and it's one school in Bismarck, in Bismarck, North Dakota. Not South Chicago, not downtown DC, Bismarck, North Dakota. But um, I wanna, before I do this, I wanna inject the hope piece because I think way too often, I, when, when, when he went through these slides with me, literally, I, I, at the end I wanted to scream, turn it off. And if, if I, who have seen you know, child sexual assault and been responsible for a team that investigated and prosecuted some of the most horrific crimes against children, wanted to turn it off. It tells you that um, many times the work that we do in this area is too overwhelming for people to really get their head around it. Uh, it, it is just too much, um, I think, of a lift um, emotionally to think about it. And so with that said, I want to I wanna, um, just, just um, read some of these slides, and it's a slide that's called Walk, Walk, Walk in Their Shoes. And, and this is, a, this is a, a school, that, an elementary school that's in a poor neighborhood in Bismarck, but Bismarck, North Dakota. I want you to think about that, think, think about the demographics of my city. So uh, 30 students have court orders stating one or more parents are not allowed contact with the child or can only have supervised visits through the Child Safety Center. 30 children. 181 children, which is almost um, half the population of this school, live in at or below poverty. Five students have had immediate family members pass away during the last school year for a number of reasons, including um, accidents and suicide. 87 students have moved on to other schools or cities. Many have not had the chance to say goodbye to their teacher or their classmate, leaving a huge gap in terms of abandonment, you know, uh, uh, displacement. Burley County Social Services has visited this school 130 times to investigate abuse and neglect charges. Two girls, ages five and six, have experienced their single mother going to prison three times. So three times in their young life, their mother has been incarcerated. A seven-year-old boy who's been adopted had a tough day at school. He had a therapy appointment that afternoon to say his final goodbye to his birth mother. He made a map to show his mother how she could find him again someday. His mom didn't show up at the therapy appointment to even say goodbye. Came back to school very angry. A seven-year-old boy often refuses to do his work and runs out of the classroom while screaming and crying. His mother's been in prison for attempted murder. She stabbed a woman 27 times for 
His father is also in prison. An eight-year-old girl has experienced her mother abandoning her for the second time this year. A single mom within the neighborhood has taken her into her home. Abandonment, one of the worst things we can do to children. On the first day of the year, a five-year-old boy leaves his classroom and heads for the front door. He's brought into the office and immediately yells, he didn't have to be so mean. My dad didn't have to be so mean. He could have just said that he was mad. He didn't have to hit. The nine-year-old boy refused to work in school and started choking himself. When his mother was called, she shared the night before the police came to her house because her husband was choking her as her nine-year-old and her six-year-old daughter watched. Seven-year-old boy is continually bouncing between mother and grandparents. Three weeks ago, his grandmother passed away, and he waits outside the school every day, wondering who's going to pick him up. Eleven-year-old boy lives with his 87-year-old great-grandma. She's on dialysis, and she has to rest three times, walking from the door into the classroom to go to his parent-teacher's conferences. Three children, age seven, nine, and 10, were in their apartment when a stranger entered with a gun. He waved the gun around, threatening the children. A friend of the family came in and wrestled with the man. The gun went off and killed the intruder in front of the children. Five-year-old boy and his two siblings are awoken in the middle of the night and put into a car. He doesn't know why. The next day, he's in a new state and enrolled in a new school, which is this school. So we have to really understand. When we're trying to understand the criminal justice system, when we're trying to understand the juvenile justice system, when we're trying to understand why children need to have um, individual education plans, we can't ignore these facts. It is the beginning. And so while we're working to prevent the conditions that lead to this trauma, we also have to experience and understand trauma treatment because we know we can help. And we've heard wonderful stories like the Menominee Tribe in Wisconsin using trauma-informed um, therapies, which resulted in doubling their high school graduation rates. This isn't make-believe. This is real. And it's not just a behavior problem. It's a physiological difference for these children. And I want you to know, if any one of these things that happened to you as an adult in this chair, how traumatized would you be? And when it happens to children, especially very young children who are in that development stage, it makes a huge difference. And so when I say we're trying to build an army of people who believe we can change outcomes, but we are not going to change outcomes if we keep doing what we've always done. It's not going to work. You know, there's great programs out there, and I'm not belittling anything. But at its core, trauma and addressing trauma in children provides the hope, in my opinion, for radical and real change for the future. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, first off, it always heartens me when I walk in this room and I see all these seats full. Thank you to the professionals and the experts who um, continue to do this work. It is so critical. And I want to thank, I don't, I don't know if he's showed up yet. Has Durbin been here? That guy, he's always late. Um, I want to thank my partner um, in this, um, two partners in this, both Dick Durbin, who, who um, was, I, I got involved in this when I started working on what we could do to change outcomes for Native American children, which is the population in my state that is, experiences the most um, highest percentage of population experiencing childhood trauma. Dick got involved when he started looking at how you're going to change the pockets of communities in Chicago that need this kind of help. And Al Franken, he's just a smart guy who knows this is a big problem. And so um, we're here. This is, this is not just check the box and we'll send out a press release. Not saying we ever do that in the Senate, but that's not what this is. This is, this is a long-term, hopefully embedded strategy for real change for the children of America. And when we speak for these children, when we understand these children, that's when we're going to change outcomes. Thank you so much for letting me come. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, you guys.
Again, thank you so much for your steadfast uh, work and being a resilience warrior who will help us create a resilient nation. So as I was saying, um, with regard to violence, as, as well as what Senator Heitkamp so eloquently showed us, is that violence happens in so many different forms to young children. But it's not just, again, what's happening in that, within that home, but it's within the context of that community. So understanding that, as she cited, there were 130 visits to social services to that one school to respond to abuse and neglect allegations. What if we had had 130 nurse visits come to that school or to that home when we saw that there was a family that was at risk? Perhaps then we wouldn't be investigating abuse and neglect. That gets us to some of the solutions that we already see that are at work, that we are funding both at the federal level and as well as the state level, that nurse home visiting programs do work. These home visiting programs are evidence-based and have shown to be able to be effective in a number of different ways in, in looking at children that are in uh, abuse or neglect, potentially, or just other issues, whether that's food insecurity or other stressors that are within the family. Then also understanding that we have evidence that the school-based violence prevention programs work. We've already invested in these programs. How can we perhaps help to spread those so that we are teaching our children a nonviolent way to deal with their stressors? Also understanding that trauma-informed training is going a long way and that our systems, our cities, a number of our cities are adopting these so that across our systems, we're not asking what's wrong with you, we're asking what happened to you. We're beginning to understand those traumas that Senator Heikamp explained. Then also cognitive in the clinical environment, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy works, helping individuals be in tune with their own stress reaction and being able to control their own emotions and diffuse themselves rather than having hands laid on, cuffs laid on, thrown into a cell. There are other ways that we can do this in a most, much more positive way that helps to promote child development. So next slide, please. So uh, you're going to hear a little bit later understanding how these exposures that Senator Heikamp described really get under the skin, why they're so critical for us to get in there early. That just like a tree with healthy branches, when a child's brain is developing at a young age, their neurons are developing, they're branching. And that these exposures, this constant stress is just like pruning a tree. Those branches never grow. So you cannot hope that a child is going to develop normally if they're not given that full opportunity to develop. If we're not reducing those stressors, if we're not putting in place those buffers that help them be stronger, more resilient, if the family doesn't have the supports that they need. Next slide. So what we've been talking about is what we talk about in the Building Community Resilience Initiative is really the pair of ACEs. It's not just adverse childhood experiences, but it's thinking about adverse childhood experiences and recognizing the adverse community environments in which they exist. So understanding that when you look below the soil there, you see a number of different contributing factors that point to a number of different systems. That we're not just talking about schools, we're not just talking about our healthcare system, but we're talking about all the systems that contribute to a healthy environment for children, for families. So understanding that in, here in Washington, D.C. and across the country, we have this phenomenon of gentrification going on. Great, our cities are being revitalized, but not for everyone. There are a number of people that are being left behind. This results in community disruption, so that when people are being, when communities wholesale are being, dis, be, being displaced and there's a lack of affordable housing, that has a real traumatic effect on families and on individuals. When you're uprooted from the school that you've already gone to, what happens to your social circle? These things add up, they all add up to having this adverse effect on children and on families. Next slide. So, the positive again. There is something that's being done about this. We're at, our project is in five cities across the country, Wilmington, Delaware, Portland, Oregon, Cincinnati, Ohio, here in Washington, D.C., as well as Dallas, Texas, working with clinicians and working across sectors to think about how we can, we can coordinate our work together as a whole system, not as a system of systems, to lessen the trauma that is, is on our community, on children, and work in a smarter way. 
Next slide, please. So that's really what this legislation is about that we're here that uh, Senators Durbin, Heitkamp, and uh, Franken have supported. The Senate Bill 774, the Trauma-Informed Care Act for Children and Families, really get at how do we foster collaboration across sectors and community and coordinate that collaboration? How do we improve coordination across federal programs supporting a trauma-informed workforce? This isn't something that just happens overnight. This isn't reading a booklet. This is really understanding how your presentation impacts another person's reaction. But that that reaction, we can, we can help a child bounce back and, and, and actually bounce forward despite adversity. Supporting the innovation in trauma-informed prevention and care and incentivize working smarter. This isn't necessarily about having more money, throwing more money at a problem. As you'll hear from Kana Inamoto, there's plenty of money that has been invested across the federal government to support some of these actions, but we haven't necessarily co coordinated it in a fashion. This legislation would help us to coordinate what we're, our investments in a way that actually incentivizes collaboration, but helps us to work smarter in our communities. There's also a companion bill in the House, 1757, that has been sponsored by Representative Danny Davis. So we have some bicameral effort that is going on with this work here. So without further delay, I want to introduce you to our panelists, Dr. Joe Wright, from Howard University's College of Medicine is going to talk to us about ACEs, give us a little bit more information on ACEs, but yet we're going to pause because we have a resilience champion here, our Senator Dick Durbin, if you'd like to come up. Thank you so much. Sorry to make the schedule so disjointed, but we were voting and running for the airport, and what senators do on Thursday afternoon. Um, I'm not going to give a speech, although I thank my staff for writing a good one. Uh, let me tell you, let me tell you three quick stories that explains why I'm co-sponsoring this bill with Heidi Heidkamp. Uh, the first story is the murder rate in Chicago. Too many teenagers with guns killing one another. And so I decided to go to the Cook County Juvenile Facility. If you're charged with murder, you're going to be in that facility for a year or two waiting trial. These are adolescents. And it's a school atmosphere, gyms and classrooms and such, uh, and they're there for a long time. So I met with some of these young people and then sat down with the psychological counselors who were there. And I said to them, since you have some time to be with them, what do you find? They said, we find everything, everything. Uh, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, all of it. But there's one thing we find in 92% of these kids. They have either been victims of violent trauma or exposed to violent trauma, 92%. I then went to Heinz VA Hospital, uh, which is not too far away, and they invited me in, gave me permission to sit in on, on a meeting. I sat in this room, and it was about 5 o'clock on a Friday, and I watched five men come into the room. You couldn't have picked them out of a lineup. You couldn't have picked them out of a crowd until they closed the door. And then a couple of them broke out in tears, and a number of them clearly were displaying anger at situations I didn't understand. They were all uh, PTSD victims, military veterans. And I thought to myself, if these grown men, they were all men, women certainly are susceptible too, uh, to this uh, challenge, but if these grown men trained to prepare for battle with those by their side to support them, went through this life experience and came home and needed help to cope with what they had seen and what they had done, what about those kids? Who's there for them? They're much more vulnerable. Last story, went to Cicero, Illinois, west side of Chicago, Hispanic school, 1,000 students, and they have a bounce back program that they're dealing with trauma. And so I met this mother, mother of two, and she explained to me what had happened. Her husband walked into the living room one night and in front of the two kids pulled out a gun and killed himself. She said those kids at that point dropped out, psychologically dropped out. They didn't want to go to school. They didn't want to see their playmates. They didn't want to do anything. But, she says, the counseling at this school has brought them back. 
They're back in the mainstream. They're doing well with their classes and such. And so I got a chance to meet the kids. You couldn't have picked these kids out of a classroom. The proper help at the proper moment in their life made all the difference. And incidentally, a mom said, I'm going next. I need help too. And so Heidi and I put in this bill. I sat around with a lot of teachers in Chicago and downstate and said, what about this? And he said, Senator, we're teachers. We're not psychologists and psychiatrists. We might be trained to recognize this, but we're not trained to treat it. And it raised the question, if not them, who? Who will it be? And the system we have out there is not exactly leak-proof. It's not exactly foolproof. And that's why we put in this bill. Let's figure out how to identify those suffering trauma who need a helping hand. Let's figure out what to do with them, how to pay for it. And let's make sure we have a system, whether it's government programs or a health insurance system, that is there for them when they need it. If we eliminate mental health counseling as an essential service in health insurance, don't you believe it's going to be gone tomorrow? Do the names Wellstone and Dominici ring a bell with you? We fought this for years to get this included. And without it, a lot of families have no place to turn. So Heidi came to this issue from Indian reservations. I came to it from what I saw in Cook County. And um, I'm glad you've come to it today. We need your help. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you for your passion on this topic. And as he said, you know, thinking about psychologists and, you know, if not them, who? And I would challenge you, if not them, all of us, really, when we think about our systems and the response to the violence and, and adversity that children are being exposed to. So let me briefly start again. Dr. Wright, who will talk, who's at Howard University, will talk to us about understanding ACEs and the, and the, um, and the effect on children. Uh, Dr. Kaminsky here from John Hopkins School of Medicine will then move to uh, helping us understand the neuroscience, the biology of ACEs, and then Kane Inamoto from SAMHSA will talk to us about some of the federally funded um, it, programs that are at SAMHSA, and then Judge Michael here from Juvenile Court of Memphis in Shelby County will actually talk about an innovative program of infusing trauma-informed courts in the juvenile justice system. So if you want to go ahead. Right, and we'll reserve questions until the end. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I should um, um, have learned by now never to follow my good friend, Dr. Ellis, who has set the stage for uh, a, a very uh, provocative and, and important discussion this afternoon. Um, I am Joseph Wright, and pediatrician and chair of the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the Howard University College of Medicine. I'm an insufferable academic, so when I saw that there was the opportunity to show slides, I, uh, I thought that was a good thing. But actually, in terms of what we need to convey today, I think the images are really important. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, of which I've been a member for 30 years and uh, which is a nonprofit organization of 66,000 uh, pediatricians, pediatric specialists, pediatric surgical specialists, all dedicated to the health and well-being of infants, children, and adolescents. I happen to currently serve as the chair of the AAP's Committee on Pediatric Emergency Medicine, and uh, this has framed my um, experience, my personal experience, as um, someone who has worked uh, throughout my career in trauma centers in New York City and Newark, New Jersey, and here in, in Washington, D.C., uh, to understand the profound effect of adverse childhood experiences on, on my clinical practice. Um, and, uh, you know, when I think about the conditions that pediatricians treat as a matter of course, asthma, diabetes, which under um, controlled circumstances are, are easily controlled and, and, and easily uh, managed in the context of, of exposure to toxic stress, which we'll be talking about, uh, these conditions become chaotic and become uh, situations that can, that can morph to life-threatening scenarios for these children and their families. The actual physiologic effects of prolonged hyperstress states 
upsets the internal metabolism such that what we're dealing with in the emergency care setting is something that is, uh, uh, again, um, medically chaotic and out of control. And these are conditions, again, where the treatment is incontrovertible. If, 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 uh, if there is compliance and, and in, this, in the context of supportive and stable family environments, these are conditions that are easily controlled. And, and this has uh, uh, been the story of my uh, clinical life in emergency medicine dealing with these kinds of situations. Now, I guess we're, you're advancing for me. So I, I wanted to take a few minutes because we have some experts. You can go to the next slide. Um, uh, Dr. Kaminsky will take a deeper dive into this. I'm just going to set the stage in talking about, I mentioned the term stress. So we all suffer from stress. Uh, this is a very stressful time. Uh, and but when we talk about levels of stress, uh, we really have to understand that uh, positive stress that, uh, for instance, uh, right now as I'm up here in front of you, I probably have uh, a little bit of a tachycardia and a uh, mild elevation of my stress, stress hormone levels, which is positive, uh, which is allowing me to be here and to convey the message. But when those uh, levels of stress uh, become more serious and stress responses that are unbuffered by supportive relationships, as may be the case in chaotic family environments or in children exposed to adverse childhood experiences, when these levels of stress rise and are unbuffered, they become untolerable and move to a toxic stage, which is really a prolonged activation of the stress response system. And uh, this is the, you can go to the next slide, where we have a circumstance where, um, you can hit it again, there's a little animation there, yeah, where our internal organs are bathed in this hyper-stressed state and the, hyper, the, the, the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis just bathes our organs in cortisol. And cortisol, which is good for a, flight or, uh, a fight or flight response, is not good for a child's internal organs to be exposed to and bathed in over uh, a prolonged period of time. So when we talk about the medical effects of, of toxic stress, it is truly a physiologic condition. This is not just a conjecture. There is science that, uh, that um, uh, speaks to this, and uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, concept of the impact of this on, on, on the brain and uh, Dr. Kaminsky will take a deeper dive on that. So when you combine these physiologic components with the environmental components that Dr. Ellis talked about, uh, the exposure to community violence, the exposure to stresses in, in, the, in the home environment, this creates a very powerful impact on a child's development and well-being. Now, uh, it's been 20 years since the, the seminal study in 1998 that um, linked the adverse childhood experiences with adult outcomes of chronic conditions published by the CDC and, and Kaiser. Um, but we've learned a lot more about the impact on children. Uh, I think that the, what we have learned over the last 20 years, it doesn't, uh, uh, there's a lot that happens between exposure and the outcome of of chronic disease expression in adults in that middle stage that can be ameliorated. And that's uh, really what we're here to talk about today. Um, so I'll just keep moving. These are our lifelong uh, stressors that if you look at the bottom of this pyramid uh, where you have the exposure that impacts across the life course and the um, National Institutes of Health specifically has insisted that all research activity in this area, looking at health disparities, focus on the fact that you don't wake up in the third and fourth decade of life with a chronic illness. This is a, an adversity that continues across the lifespan. And it's important to understand that um, I, I, I like this image because it suggests that there is opportunity, there is resilience, because certainly not everyone who is at the bottom of this period rises to those uh, deleterious outcomes at the top. And it's important to understand what drives that complex milieu of factors that uh, confer risk and resilience, and, um, and understanding that is, is, is critically important. 
Um, if you can go to the next slide, this, this is um, uh, something I learned from Dr. Ellis, that uh, adverse childhood experiences are an American problem. Uh, don't pay attention to the numbers. I just want you to look at the, the relative size of those bars. They're all just about the same. And this is uh, data from the Centers for Disease Control, uh, which points out the fact that there are adverse experiences across the spectrum. So you heard from Senator Heitkamp a moment ago. Uh, it's not just in the communities where I've practiced emergency medicine where this is an issue. Um, Senator Heitkamp talked about Bismarck, North Dakota. This slide shows adverse childhood experiences across ethnicity. And uh, so, uh, so this is indeed an American problem, why this legislation is so important. However, we do have to understand that there is a disproportionate burden of the deleterious outcomes from adverse childhood experiences borne by communities of color, and certainly the advent of associated health disparities and the heightened chronic disease expression in communities is, is, is quite significant uh, where there are those um, uh, community factors that Dr. Ellis talked about. Um, next slide, please. So this is the, to, for me as a pediatrician, this was as I was learning about the science, um, uh, I am uh, a clinical um, uh, researcher, not a basic science researcher, so it, it took me a moment to wrap my head around the concept of intergenerational transmission and understanding what that meant. So we've always been um, taught about the cycle of adverse uh, outcomes, that cycle of violence, if you will. It's been sort of a pejorative term, but when I realized that the actual influences of, of these environmental exposures actually change the DNA structure, change the genetics. Uh, the term epigenetics is something that didn't even exist when I was coming through school, but the science has, has now advanced to the point where we understand that the influence of environmental exposures actually embeds itself into the genetic structure that can be passed on to the next generation. That was a very sobering concept to me because it suggests that in terms of intervention, that it has to be such a deeply embedded, um, intense process that we, to actually reverse the impacts of this intergenerational um, uh, genetic component. And uh, I think it's important to understand this because it's not just the uh, impacts that need to take place in the community and the home environments. These are intense interventions that need to occur early. And I'll, and I'll show you a slide in just a moment to, to stress why that is so very important. And they need to be impacted across the life course, okay? Um, it's not enough to um, really deal with a family if you're not dealing with the family as a whole. A child is always in the context of a dyad, a child and a caretaker. And they both have to be part of any kind of intervention activities in order for this to take. Next slide, please. So I mentioned a moment ago about the importance of starting early. So this was a, another sobering yet hopeful slide. Um, when I was coming through school, uh, we were sort of taught that you had what you, you got to about um, mid-adolescence, maybe late adolescence, and you had what you had in terms of your, your neurodevelopment. Uh, we've learned now that there is a great deal of neuroplasticity that continues to go on into adulthood, and that the malleability of the brain and the nervous system is, uh, is quite dynamic. However, the ability to change the response to experiences, both good and bad, uh, is, is, is much better earlier on. And what this slide depicts is the, um, the ability early on to make change that decreases, decreases over the lifespan. And for any of you who are, uh, are uh, parents of, of adolescents or young adults, uh, you can clearly understand the, 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 the dynamic um, uh, potential for uh, I have a Leo the late bloomer in my household, for where there is the opportunity to impact positive effect and change with the proper nurturing and support. And this is an important concept 
um, that uh, is embedded in the science that we've learned over the course of the last 20 years. So back to the legislation at hand, next slide. Um, so I just returned from the Pediatric Academic Society meetings, which is our major um, academic um, gathering for uh, pediatrics in this country. It was in San Francisco, and I took the opportunity to visit the practice of Dr. Nadine Burke, Burke Harris. She is a member of the American County of Pediatrics, a uh, shameless plug. But um, uh, Dr. Burke Harris uh, is uh, the 2016 Heinz Award winner for human, the human condition, which is one of the six prizes given by the Heinz Foundation for exceptional Americans for creativity and determination in finding solutions to critical issues. And if you look at the very first provision of the legislation, it, it states that best practices need to be identified. Well, in, in Dr. Harris's practice in San Francisco, uh, the Center for Youth Wellness, she has embedded a process whereby she screens every single child, every single child who comes through her practice for adverse childhood experiences. She has embedded this into her practice. This is not an add-on piece of training, uh, something that is um, um, uh, nice but not necessary. This is something that she has incorporated not only into her practice, but then uses to be able to holistically treat these children and their families. And so from a clinical perspective, Dr. Dr. Burke Harris represents the cutting edge of where, at least in pediatrics, we need to be in identifying best practices to combat adverse childhood experience in the clinical setting. So this is but a slice of what needs to happen, but, but I, would, um, uh, uh, I would contest that this is an example a best practice example of what needs to happen in, in primary care. She's a primary care pediatrician uh, working in the community where we need to go with the approach to adverse childhood experiences. So um, I've um, uh, coming up on my time here and I wanna make sure that Dr. Kaminsky really drills down on the, on the science that I've introduced, um, but I, I think it's important to um, for me to say that the American Academy of Pediatrics clearly endorses this legislation. This is something that is right in the wheelhouse, as, as I've just mentioned, of the pediatric community, something that our students need to be clearly trained in at early stages. We have to retrofit the medical education model so that um, uh, the next time someone's here briefing you, uh, they don't have to confess that they, they hadn't known about epigenetics or any of this science. Um, I've had to retrofit my own knowledge here in order to incorporate it into my job as a medical school professor and teacher of the next generation. And uh, certainly the legislation speaks to that. Um, next slide. Now this gentleman was neither a neuro, neuroscientist nor a pediatrician, but he recognized a long time ago, in the last century, I'll, I'll, I'll withhold my, my first comment. <laughs> that it's easier to build children, strong children, than to repair broken men, Frederick Douglass, 1817, 1895. So with that, I think, uh, Wendy, I'll bring you back up so we can move on to the next presenter, Kaminsky. Dr. Kaminsky. All right, let's see if I can advance these. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for being here and listening to, to my talk. My name is Zach Kaminsky. I'm uh, at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Psychiatry and I'll be talking about trauma and epigenetics. Okay, so really this is a talk about passing our experience or really disease risk onto our children through our DNA. Uh, we used to think that wasn't possible, it was just genetic risk factors that were the problem, and it didn't matter what we did, but I'm going to tell you that science is not supporting that. Uh, so there are numerous, numerous epidemiological studies, first of all, that demonstrate that altered psychiatric, and in fact not just psychiatric, but other disease outcomes, cancer, uh, heart disease, for example, in, uh, exist in children of parents who have experienced disaster and trauma. 
so the seminal study was the Dutch famine winter where um, children of parents who experienced that had increased rates of obesity as well as psychiatric problems. Um, and also, uh, historical trauma in Native American communities, for example, has been uh, linked to increased risk for suicides uh, and in the offspring. So that's uh, previous generation risks, but also if we talk about ACEs for a second, that's adverse childhood experiences. Uh, children who have experienced these also face higher rates of disease risk, including psychiatric disease. So uh, a number of very large uh, studies that were mentioned um, show a graded relationship between the number of ACEs and outcomes, including depression, suicide, drug and alcohol use, liver disease, obesity, heart uh, disease, and cancer, among others. Okay, so. Clearly, trauma is affecting us on a physiological level. Um, a key factor on how this may be uh, influencing us, not one, not the only system, but one of the major systems is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis. This is our stress response, okay? Um, essentially, uh, okay. There we go. All right. So uh, normal stress response is important for normal functions. Almost anything can elucidate or uh, be, uh, begin a stress response. Anything from uh, uh, illness or work demands, uh, having a cup of coffee or relationship problems or possibly even playing Frogger um, can <laughs> elicit a stress response. But it's when this is dysregulated that we get a problem. So ACEs, for example, have been associated with an altered HPA axis according to a number of stress hormones, ACTH and cortisol. Um, dysregulated HPA axis is also an underlying feature of a number of mental illnesses. It's a common feature, um, including PTSD, depression, suicide, and anxiety, amongst others. So there are a number of imaging studies. You know, we've got uh, brain scanners now, and what we see when we have a dysregulated stress response over uh, a long time is that our brain rewires. We have altered connectivity between different brain regions. I have a number of key structures up there, and I'm going to show you what your brain on stress looks like. Essentially, what we have is that the frontal area, this is our shield, the brake pad, decreases while the amygdala area increases in terms of activity. And uh, so this area, for example, is involved in decision-making, impulse control, inhibition of negative thoughts. You could kind of intuitively see how these might be linked with psychiatric problems, while the fear and anxiety uh, system is increased. And these can all uh, institute a positive feedback loop with our stress response. Okay, so this is some of the physiology in brief, but now let's talk about DNA, okay? DNA is really the blueprint of biology. What's a blueprint? A blueprint is a plan that uh, is in writing basically to make something complex like a house. And DNA is really the blueprint of what makes a human, okay? So the DNA is the same in absolutely every cell of the body, but um, somehow uh, it can make a human, okay? So um, for example, there's evidence to suggest that uh, cross-generational factors um, are, are the way in which uh, stress can affect the next generation, and this is mediated through the epigenetic code. Okay, but let's back up. What is epigenetics? Okay, well, epigenetics is simply the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Uh, <laughs> this is my biased way of looking at it, of course. And, um, you know, if you go on Wikipedia and you look up epigenetics, I think you get this picture. And it's a very complex picture, but what it looks like is that we have our DNA, and it is either uh, elongated or it's compacted. Okay, so this is determined by chemical modifications written on top of the DNA. I think that epi relates to on top of genetic, so epigenetic. Um, so for example, methylation of the DNA uh, can cause compaction. And also, DNA is wrapped around these spool uh, proteins called histones, and the modifications to those histone tails control how tightly it's wrapped. So basically, epigenetic patterns are the light switch of DNA, or really the dimmer switch. So if we have DNA methylation, for example, transcription factors cannot gain access. They're blocked. They can't bind. This gene is turned off. Conversely, no DNA methylation. We can get significant gene expression, okay? Now remember, what, what is gene expression? Well, if DNA is the blueprint, uh, gene expression goes to making the machines of the cell, proteins, right? The things that actually do the work. So we've got the blueprint, we've got uh, what the factor is outputting. So um, whether these machines are turned on. There's also another factor I'll, I'll mention called microRNAs, which uh, are kind of interesting, but these can go and sort of um, uh, degrade uh, these proteins, uh, these machines, and sort of uh, throw them away. Okay, that'll be relevant in a second. Okay, so epigenetic patterns are critically important for normal biological function. So I mentioned that epigenetic patterns, uh, DNA, 
is the blueprint, it's the same in every cell of the body. So what makes a cell in your brain different from one in your liver? Well, the answer is simply that the epigenetic pattern determines cell uh, differentiation. It determines cell type. Another striking example is in these mice. These are isogenic. They're inbred. They have the same exact genome. And yet, despite that, you can see they have a striking phenotypic difference. This is due purely to a DNA methylation or epigenetic difference. Um, you can see that it causes biological changes, okay, and phenotypic changes. Now, critically, epigenetic patterns stand at the interface of genes in the environment. And environmental exposures during gestation and later in the postnatal period represent the earliest non-genetically mediated source of variation, potentially conferring risk to disease. And there's some evidence, uh, although it's controversial, that this could potentially be inherited uh, through the germline as well. Um, I'll mention some of this. It's controversial because it's hard to study. But um, essentially, you know, what we see are things like this. This is DNA methylation patterns in red, um, children of Holocaust survivors and their parents. And you can see a correlation between methylation at a key stress response gene. This is a gene that's going to be controlling those brain connectivity patterns that I mentioned. While controls who weren't uh, in the Holocaust um, did not see this relationship. So there's, there's relationships that we see. We don't have the mechanism yet. One intriguing possible mechanism is through microRNAs. If you take a, a father mouse and you stress him out, then this mouse's children are going to show depressive and anxious behavior. Um, and then if you take uh, father mice and you stress them out and then you extract the microRNA from the sperm and inject these into fertilized oocytes and then bring them up with completely different parents, fine parents, they still get the behavioral abnormalities. They're still depressed, suggesting that somehow through the germline something is being passed on, which means that our experience, whether a mom or dad was experiencing trauma, could potentially be passed on whether they were pregnant or not. But during pregnancy, there's a lot of data to suggest that uh, cross-placental mechanisms are a major risk factor for conferring behavior to the next generation. So we know that uh, offspring of depressed mothers show increased autism spectrum disorder rates, as well as uh, different neuroimaging uh, endophenotypes um, and neurobehavioral scale differences. And critically, what we find by studying cord blood uh, taken at birth is that the epigenetic code is reprogrammed across uh, the placenta so high levels of cortisol, high levels of anxiety or depression in the mom change the DNA methylation pattern of the stress hormone receptor. Um, probably others, but of course, uh, this is where a lot of the science is focused uh, at the moment. So here's just an example. Um, Canada's worst natural disaster, the ice storm uh, data, uh, where maternal distress score is uh, correlated with the epigenetic pattern of key stress genes in 13-year-old offspring. So this is affecting the epigenetic code of the next generation. All right. And so there's a lot of data also to suggest that now this is where ACEs come in, okay, the postnatal period. Now we're talking about kids and trauma that kids experience, all right? And so we know the seminal studies were done in rat. Now rats can either be good moms or bad moms. Um, and so the bad mom uh, rats actually, uh, their children, their offspring, have increased stress response, uh, reduced exploration, increased fearfulness, impairments in learning and memory. And actually, when these mice grow up, rats, sorry, they become bad moms themselves. Um, and so the cycle propagates. Uh, and uh, Weaver and colleagues out of Michael Meany's group years ago showed that when the rat uh, mom is good, this creates a happy serotonin uh, in the brain, which basically leads through a signaling cascade that changes the epigenome at the glucocorticoid receptor receptor, the stress hormone receptor, that is a key for regulating that HPA axis that I mentioned, the stress response. So this is ultimately epigenetically recoding the stress response. And then McGowan and colleagues in humans showed that abuse was associated with the same epigenetic changes uh, in the brains of uh, uh, abused suicide completers relative to non-abused. All right, but it's not just abuse, these extreme uh, exposures that can cause these changes. In fact, other studies have shown that just institutionalization can cause the same epigenetic changes in these stress hormone genes. So uh, this has relevance, for example, to Native American communities where um, children were forcibly separated uh, from their parents for decades and put in institutions. And we wonder uh, why there might be high rates of, uh, or why there are high rates of um, uh, suicide and other out disease outcomes uh, in Native American communities. Okay, so what's the consequence of all this? Well, it's gonna be a bad day. We've got school, perhaps a tough day at work, or we're headed for active engagement in the military. We've got stress hormones, cortisol is flooding the system. This is going to bind the GR, glucocorticoid receptor, the stress hormone receptor. 
okay? These uh, hormones under normal circumstances will help us deal with stress, fight or flight, get us across that Frogger game. But then they'll go into the nucleus and um, they will bind to DNA and institute a negative feedback response when the time is right, and they will shut down the stress response and we will go back to living our lives as normal. However, when the epigenetic code causes changes to the amounts of these genes, when the protein levels are lower, we get insufficient negative feedback and we get a failure to suppress the stress response. We have a failure to inhibit our negative thoughts, a failure to inhibit fear and um, other toxic effects of stress. We get that reprogramming in the brain that we saw. Okay. So why are our genes doing this to us? All right, why, why, why would we have evolved this way? Well, the answer uh, is probably in evolutionary biology. So back in caveman days when we were um, running around, predators everywhere, uh, when we have offspring, then this child goes down to the watering hole and they think, oh, this will be fine. They're not stressed out at all. They don't have a heightened stress response. Perhaps they get eaten. But the, uh, the wary child um, in a stressed uh, uh, environment will be anxious, they will be wary, they'll survive. Remember, the genes don't care if we get mental illness. They just care if you survive to childbearing age and pass on. That's what genes have evolved to do, okay? So remember now, this isn't purely deterministic. This is a diathesis model. This is vulnerability meets stress. And the ACEs and the maternal exposures, they create a vulnerability that maybe later in life uh, interacts with stress. And I'm going to use my bicycle analogy here. So this is a nice new bike. This is a child, for example. And this has uh, various uh, resiliency characteristics here uh, shown in the shock absorbers. And then we have another perfectly new bike, um, and perhaps uh, this child has come with various vulnerabilities, other features. And then um, we have the road to life. So uh, the road to life has various, uh, this is a relatively smooth road, school transitions, job moves, house moves, stressful life events, but we're going to weather this fine. And then we have another road to life, maybe we're in Cook County in Chicago, um, with uh, tougher school transitions, other challenges to face. And you can just imagine here where the trait meeting state could be fine in many scenarios. However, uh, we, when these are paired up, when stress meets stress vulnerability, we're going to have psychopathology and uh, deleterious consequences. Okay, so um, very uh, quickly, uh, it's not just um, uh, science that's showing this. The National Institutes of Mental Health has instituted a new research um, uh, relatively, well, it's not new anymore, but it's sort of emerging, called RDOC, where essentially they're looking for um, uh, alterations in adaptive uh, systems like reward responsiveness and threat sensitivity to try to explain disease instead of just classifying people as depressed, not depressed, or, or schizophrenia, not. To better understand the, uh, the biology of this, which will allow for uh, uh, better interventions and therapies. So, of course, um, it's going to be important uh, to implement trauma-centered interventions uh, to break the cycle. So, for example, um, if this baby is traumatized, when this baby becomes a mom, for example, um, they may pass on through epigenetic reprogramming uh, vulnerabilities. And then if we uh, break this cycle with trauma-informed interventions, um, we can then essentially uh, proceed to... Uh, uh, a bright future. All right, well, uh, I've got my two-minute warning, but I am done, so, uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you. Um. Thank you. You know, when you listen to these stories, how you start thinking about how they apply to your life, and so I'm listening to Dr. Kaminsky, and it's fascinating, this cross-placental transmission of parental behavior, and I started feeling very sorry for my daughter, who has, like, <laughs> the inability to restrict the expression of her own opinions, um, which she's obviously inherited from her mother. Um, <laughs> But, um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kana Enomoto. I'm from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and uh, a long time fan of Senators Heitkamp and, and Durbin and absolutely appreciative of their uh, leadership uh, in this space of um, advancing trauma-informed care uh, for children and their families. I'm also grateful to the organizers of this event. Uh, you all are, are visionaries and I appreciate your efforts to foster uh, safe and nurturing environments for children and, and families, uh, their families who've experienced trauma. So American Academy of Pediatrics, Futures Without Violence, uh, National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges, uh, and campaign for trauma-informed policy and practice. This work is so important. 
Um, as we talk today about approaches and interventions to prevent and mitigate the impact of trauma, it's important to remember that many systems that are touching the children's lives and the families' lives, and it's been touched on. I know we've gone a little bit more into the basic science and the basic health care. Um, but as we move out into the systems, we really need to think about how they touch one another because they have so much impact even on the most uh, vulnerable lives. Uh, so I'm going to share with you... Um, uh, the story of uh, baby Asa. He is the child uh, of a colleague of mine, an adoptive uh, child of a colleague of mine who's given me uh, permission to share his story. Uh, baby Asa's birth mother had experienced childhood trauma and that went unaddressed. Uh, and by her early teens, she was experiencing uh, behavioral health problems, behavioral problems, using marijuana, using alcohol. And when she was 12 years old, she woke up in bed to find her mother overdosed next to her. Um, in high school, a boyfriend introduced her to using, misusing prescription pain medications, and then eventually she became addicted to heroin, uh, bath salts, and methamphetamine. In a few short years, this young woman went from being a promising, healthy scholar athlete uh, to an 80-pound dropout found overdosed on heroin in a shopping mall parking lot. Uh, Asa was born, as you can see, three months premature, suffered through many harrowing weeks and months and now years of severe symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And as you all uh, well know, and as you have heard uh, this afternoon, trauma is a multi-generational problem which will require multi-generational solutions. Um, we have a profile of Asa's uh, young parents, 19 and 22 years old. When he was born, they'd had uh, interfaces with juvenile justice, education, public welfare, public health, behavioral health, child welfare, orphans court where their parental rights were ultimately terminated, and the adult criminal justice system where they both are now. Uh, only by working together could these systems have cast a safety net wide enough to catch these struggling adolescents, and unfortunately we were not able to break their hearts. These, uh, they uh, they, uh, are, they represent the faces of untreated trauma, mental illness, and addiction. As we know, and as we've heard uh, today, these have uh, wide-ranging impacts through the adverse childhood experiences and what we understand uh, about this, between the stunning link of childhood trauma and chronic disease, as well as behavioral health and social problems. This is uh, baby Asa at uh, 12 months. He's a he's a pretty he's a pretty cute little critter, um, uh, but you know he walked into he came into the world uh, with a deck stacked against him with parental substance use, uh, with termination of parental rights, with exposure to domestic violence, um, and and just walking through the door, Isa came in with a, a a score of four, and what we've heard is that of those 17,000 participants in the original ACE study, we know that at the score of four or more, you're seven times uh, more likely to report having abused alcohol, you're 12 times uh, more likely to die by suicide. Uh, and he was just a baby born into a context uh, which put him at such high risk. And he's not alone. Uh, a recent uh, study in New England Journal of Medicine found that the admission of opioid-dependent babies to U.S. neonatal intensive care units nearly quadrupled from 2004 and 2013. You heard a little earlier from 7 to 27 uh, per 100,000 per, per 1,000 admissions. So the rates are highest uh, in um, sort of the Appalachia, uh, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, and Kentucky areas. Hear more about that. In Kentucky, one of the hardest hit states, hospitalizations for drug dependent newborns soared 48% in one year uh, from about 1,000, less than 1,000 in 2013 to more than 1,400 in 2014. And it's a startling 50 fold rise uh, since 2000. There were only 28 opioid dependent admissions in uh, 2000, 1,409 in 2000. That's amazing. And if these babies follow ACE's path, there will be an astounding number of children beginning life with a long list of childhood traumas. And if, like ASA, uh, they end up entering the foster care system, we will continue to see the number of children entering care chart upward dramatically. And we know uh, that while there are many, many wonderful professionals working in uh, foster care, uh, we are seeing such high rates of trauma among these kids, with approximately 90% of children in the foster care system exposed to trauma. Uh, so it is important for us to work hard to make an impact on complex trauma for children who've experienced maltreatment uh, because the, the impact can be so profound 
uh, derailing healthy development, uh, impairing social and emotional functioning, and compromising health. Uh, the effects can be addressed, as we've heard, and uh, children can heal and recover, and that is uh, what SAMHSA is trying to do uh, through our policy work, through our programmatic work, and through our technical assistance efforts. I want to talk to you about a few of those things today. Uh, first, we'll look at how SAMHSA is impacting and informing policy. In 2013, we partnered with ACF and the uh, Administration for Children and Families and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and sent a joint letter to our state and or our respective state and tribal partners. We acknowledged uh, a growing interest across the nation in taking action to implement trauma-focused screening, functional assessments, and evidence-based practices in child-serving ses settings. Uh, we offered our collective support of uh, state and tribal efforts in this space uh, to address complex trauma, uh, complex interpersonal trauma, and improve social emotional health among children known uh, in child welfare settings. And so we've talked about how do we pay uh, for services to address complex trauma and how do we get the systems uh, to work together. Another piece we did uh, uh, subsequently was releasing a concept paper because we realized that as we were working across and talking with different systems, uh, not everyone was using the word tr trauma uh, or trauma-informed care in the same way. And so SAMHSA brought together experts uh, from across many disciplines, child and adult, uh, women-focused, veteran-focused, uh, child welfare-focused, disaster-focused, uh, and so for domestic violence, uh, and, and asked them uh, to think about uh, developing a shared concept of trauma so that we could have a common parlance. And so we put forth a framework uh, that can be adapted to uh, multiple sectors, behavioral health, child welfare, education, criminal and juvenile justice, primary care, military, and other settings. And we talk about uh, that trauma, uh, the, the concept of trauma includes an event uh, which a person experiences as harmful or life-threatening, and then that has long uh, longer lasting effects uh, um, uh, on their physical, mental, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So there's three E's, there's an event, there's an experience and the effect, and together when you, and so one person's event, one person's experience, one person's effect may not be the same, uh, but when we look at their collective impact on an individual, we can understand that they are in fact experiencing trauma. Another way that uh, SAMHSA is affecting policy and, and permeating a, a perspective on trauma throughout our policy work, uh, a great example of this is a, a National Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda, which we released in December 2016. Um, the idea for this comprehensive document came from tribal leaders uh, who came to SAMHSA and said, you need to work with your partners at the federal level, you need to work with us uh, so that we can have a framework uh, or a single vision uh, for how to advance uh, behavioral health in uh, for Native people, but one that takes into consideration traditional culture, uh, indigenous practices, and issues uh, like uh, intergenerational trauma and historical trauma. And so uh, the TBHA does identify priorities. Uh, it was developed by tribal communities in consultation uh, with federal uh, partners and national partners like uh, the National Indian Health Board and National Congress of American Indians. And it guides incorporation of strategies to improve the well-being of youth, families, and communities in a tribal, uh, culturally informed, trauma-informed context. Um, another uh, way that SAMHSA makes its uh, impact, and many of us, many people think of us um, primarily as a grant-making organization. We do have uh, a number of grants uh, that that um, focus on trauma. One of them is our Recast program. Uh, in this, one of our grantees is the Chicago Department of Public Health, which manages the Resiliency in Communities After Stress and Trauma grant from SAMHSA. Uh, Chicago was awarded a recast, recast grant due to multiple incidents of civil unrest in recent years, resulting from officer-involved shootings and the accompanying breakdown in relationships between uh, law enforcement and communities of color. Uh, the Chicago Recast grant uh, is working in high-risk, obviously in high-risk neighborhoods, uh, where we're, um, there are challenged opportunities for children and their families to participate uh, in, in meaningful activities and in their health care. The grantee is going to address trauma related to civil unrest at its roots uh, in these marginalized communities by conducting training and capacity building to make Chicago a trauma-informed city. Uh, they're looking to set policy and protocols that have a trauma lens and to promote access to trauma-informed behavioral health practices and services for over 200,000 Chicagoans. Uh, and that is uh, our recast grant. 
Um, sort of the jewel in the crown of SAMHSA's trauma portfolio is our National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative. Uh, it began in 2000. Uh, the NITSI has developed and implemented evidence-based interventions and promising practices to reduce uh, the immediate distress from exposure to traumatic events. Uh, it's also developed and provided training and trauma-focused approaches for, uh, for uh, the use uh, over the course of many years in many systems, ch child mental health clinics, schools, child welfare, juvenile justice, uh, disaster, and so on. Um, so every year we serve about 50,000 children uh, with these evidence-based mental health uh, services uh, through the program. <coughs> And our data are showing, uh, we have data from over 4,000 clinical cases each year, which are demonstrating significant uh, improvement in outcome measures. So we're seeing a rise of 65% in, uh, in uh, social emotional functioning and a rise of 45% from baseline on social connectedness, connectedness from these young people. And so we know uh, that across, across types of trauma, across interventions, we can uh, there are multiple evidence-based practices we can use, and we'll see improvements across the board. There's so much uh, we can, uh, uh, we know what to do, and that we can do, uh, but it is a matter of getting it out there. So that takes us to uh, our efforts in the space of technical assistance. Again, through the National Trial Traumatic Stress Network, we do a great deal of, of technical assistance uh, on these issues, on the evidence-based practices that are developed by our, our level two uh, academic research centers and then implemented in our level three community uh, centers, uh, community uh, and clinical locations. Um, and now we're, we're really focused on making sure that that good work uh, gets captured and then gets disseminated throughout the country. And we've got some tremendous outcomes uh, uh, productivity, uh, pr tremendous productivity. So since its inception, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has trained more than one million health professionals, including uh, mental health, primary care, child welfare, and so on. Uh, our Nitsen, the Nitsen.org website had 1.4 million visitors last year. Uh, there are over 210 resources on the website, downloaded uh, 50,000 times a year with more than 2,000 visits per day. It's a very, 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 very well-trafficked site, uh, picking up uh, a lot of professionals uh, who are able to use these materials. Um, in uh, our learning center alone, there's 175 expert webinars, uh, many with uh, continuing education units available for free. Um, so we, yeah, all right. Um, uh, some of these webinars have uh, as many as 100,000 participants. So we are, getting, uh, we are getting the word out there, but we need to do so much more. And I think uh, that's uh, what we're hopefully uh, trying to stimulate today. Um, another important uh, part of the network is the National Native Children's Trauma Center, the NNCTC, uh, which again works on a multi-system approach to address the effects of childhood traumatic stress among our uh, very vulnerable AIAN populations. Uh, it's housed at the University of Montana College of Education and Human Sciences, providing training uh, across the nation for mental health services that are particularly effective uh, for Native youth and in rural settings and in schools. And one of the great uh, innovations that they have identified is uh, these school-based uh, group interventions that are achieving outcomes uh, akin to uh, the, the level of outcome that we have seen in one-to-one -one psychotherapy, uh, but that you're able to reach 10 to 15 children at a time uh, and get comparable uh, improvements in PTSD or depression or anxiety symptomatology. Uh, which is very, very impressive uh, and obviously um, lends itself to being scalable in these rural areas where you also have workforce shortages. Um, uh, so we are making uh, good progress, but we obviously can and uh, need to do more. It doesn't get a lot cuter than that. Um, this, is, this was Asa um, at Easter. And uh, while he continues uh, to experience neurological challenges uh, and, and other physical challenges from his, from his uh, uh, dr uh, perinatal drug exposure or his prenatal drug exposure, um, it, two years has made a big difference for Asa. He's got a soft landing. He's got an adoptive family. Uh, he's, he's making progress. Uh, he laughs, he giggles, he runs, he plays. Um, but Asa, uh, two months ago, got a foster sister. Um, the county called Asa's mom and said, we have a young woman who's experienced trauma. She was in drug treatment. She's addicted to heroin, uh, but she just had a breakdown and we have to send her to the hospital. Can you watch baby Libby for a couple of days? But unfortunately, baby Libby's mom went to the hospital and it turns out she got diagnosed with schizophrenia. 
uh, and the, the mental health facility was unable to take Libby's mom because she has an active addiction. The drug treatment facility wouldn't take her back because she has schizophrenia. So Libby's mom is living in a boarding care. A young 23-year-old mother with six men living down the hall, it's probably not a, a recipe for a good outcome. Uh, and so Libby uh, has an almost identical story to baby Asa, and we've, re we've repeated the cycle. Um, and so these, these babies have been uh, dealt a really difficult uh, deck with a great deal of trauma from the get-go, um, but their stories have not yet been written. Uh, they do have the support of a system. They do have the support of a loving foster care and adoptive home. And I hope that we can work together to make sure that their story is different and what they deserve. So thank you very much. This is a tough group to follow. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you down from the science to the ground. First and foremost, one of the things you need to understand um, that I talk about all the time in the work I do as a juvenile court judge is this is expensive stuff. And I don't mean the cost of fixing it. I mean the cost of not fixing it. I'm going to tell you two stories, one of failure and one of success. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in my hometown around this. I'm here as the juvenile court judge of Memphis and Shelby County and a representative from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges who take this work very seriously. My first story is a story of failure. His name is Dedrick. That's what I'll call him. He was born to a mother who was addicted to crack cocaine. Uh, she went to prison for that and he was handed off to his aunt. At about the time he started walking, his aunt got mad at him, so she took an iron and burned the sole of his feet. He had third-degree burns on both feet. He had to be taught to walk after they healed. He had several skin grafts. Of course, he was removed from his aunt, and he was placed with an uncle who began to sexually abuse him and starve him. When he quit going to school, the school stepped in, found out what was going on, and took him away again. He bounced from relative to relative in that family. Mother got out of prison, and he went back to mom, who was still abusing drugs. By the time he was nine, he had been through several sexual relationships with mom's boyfriends, who were numerous, and he and the mother got in an argument. He was bigger than she was. He hit her. He now got arrested for the first time at nine years of age for domestic violence. His life then turned to one fight after another at school that never got reported to the judicial system. He got expelled numerous times. He then came back into the system for three or four more domestic violence situations where programs were thrown at him that weren't evidence-based. They felt good, you think they work, but you don't collect the data to make sure the outcomes are accurate. He then started breaking into houses. He came in front of me as juvenile court judge at the ripe old age of 16, charged with first degree murder. Now, for folks in my business, in juvenile justice and in criminal justice, we're not surprised when children show up in front of us charged with first degree murder. You take a three-month-old, you burn their feet, you sexually abuse them, you starve them, you beat on them, you rape them. When they get big enough, they're going to fight back. That's a natural reaction. That's how they survive. They don't know where the next punch is coming from. Their system is owned all the time. They're in a fight-or-flight mode constantly. So when he broke into that home, and he thought the homeowner was gone, and he stole some electronics and picked up the loaded shotgun, and the homeowner came out of the bedroom, he shot him and killed him. Now, all the money that was spent to try to keep that young man out of trouble is now going to be spent on keeping him incarcerated because he was convicted of first-degree murder 50 years. 
do the math. Until he's 19, it's about $184,000 a year. After that, it'll drop somewhere down in the 40000s per year if he survives that long in prison. He wasn't that big to begin with. The trauma that that young man saw in his short life out in the community is what put him in front of me when he was charged with first-degree murder. I'd never seen the kid before until he showed up in my courtroom charged with first-degree murder. Had we done what we know now we can do, we could have stopped that the first time he came into the system as an abused child. But the system ignored it. They didn't have the data. They didn't have the training. They didn't have the evidence-based programs. We failed not just that young man, but we failed the homeowner that died. And I say we, I'm not excusing the young man's behavior. The trauma that he suffered is not an excuse, but it's a reason why he was standing in front of me at 18 charged with first-degree murder. Now, let me give you a success story. I'll call her Sarah. She was 14, and she was tiny. I bet she didn't weigh 90 pounds soaking wet. She was in a sexual relationship with her boyfriend, and she, her trauma was that she had watched her mother waste away with cancer over the years, and her father was not in her life. She struggled to maintain an A average in school. She was a pretty smart young lady. They lived with her aunt, and when her mother died, her father stepped in and took her. She hadn't seen him in three or four years. She didn't really know him. He refused to let her go to mom's funeral for whatever reason. The young lady started slipping in school. She started having problems. Dad ignored them. Uh, his solution to her problems was a belt or an extension cord. She saw her boyfriend one afternoon at school laughing and joking with another girl, and she got mad. So the next morning when he came over to walk her into school, she enticed him into the bedroom. Dad was gone. Got him to put on a blindfold. 17-year-old boy, he's going to do what she wanted him to do. And then she stabbed him in the heart. He lived. She got dressed and went to school. He pulled the knife out and got dressed and went to school fell inside the school door. But he survived. Prosecutor brought her in front of me at 14 and wanted me to send her downtown to stand trial as an adult. And I said, can't do it. 14, not going to do it. I've got five years. And if I can get her into treatment in the programs I know that work, let her brain mature just a wee bit, we're going to save her. It was a fight. I sentenced her to five years in the juvenile justice system until she was 19. Um, her father was non-compliant with the treatment. She was non-compliant with the treatment. I fought the treatment system because the system is designed to put a square peg in a round hole. And Once we've got you in there firmly, it's time to cut you loose. And I wouldn't allow it to happen. They came back at me every six months trying to let, me, let her out, and I wouldn't do it. Well, several years went by. I finally told him to stop coming back until she had one full year of compliance. And I'm getting written reports. Dad has turned the corner. He's doing great. She's turned the corner. She's doing great. State filed a motion, brought her in front of me to release her to her dad, get her out of treatment early. She's about 17 and a half. And I'll never forget that day. They showed up in the courtroom, and it's a courtroom about this size. It's a big courtroom. And over here, I had the two prosecutors in that. The victim's family had long since quit coming. And over here, I probably had 20 people from our Youth Villages program where she was all these years. And her dad was there, and her dad and I started talking, and he was smiling, and I was congratulating him on his success and getting with the program. And the vast majority were adult women, and they were all dressed in business suits. And Sarah wasn't there. And I said, where's Sarah? And this young lady standing in the front of the group raised her that I'm here, Judge. The difference in that 14-year-old and that 17-and-a-half-year-old was the difference in day and night. I didn't recognize her, and I had seen her two dozen times. I did not recognize her. Two things had happened. One, the cognitive behavior therapy that we used to get her where she needed to be 
wedded with the fact that her brain matured enough to, so it kicked in. She got a full ride at an engineering college in town and the local university, and she's in college now making straight A. She's doing real well, and it's because we used the programs we knew that would be effective for her. She, she's going to be paying taxes. She's not going to be costing the state money or the federal government money, right? Well, in, in Shelby County, we're doing a lot of work around that work we did with Sarah. Juvenile Court of Memphis, Shelby County, by the end of this year, will be a fully in trauma-informed court. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I was supposed to be in trauma training today, but I'm in Washington. Um, we're training literally all 300 people in the building from the maintenance staff up through the bailiffs, probation officers, and judges. We're reaching out to our police departments, our sheriff's departments, our public defenders, and our prosecutors. One of the things we've not talked about today is what I call vicarious trauma. I've worn a robe, and I've, sit in, I've sat in a juvenile court courtroom for 20 years, and I have to tell you some of the things I've seen I'll never forget. And one of the benefits of training the staff not only to help the families who come to us with that trauma, it helps the staff learn to deal with the vicarious trauma that they deal with every day. Frontline officers, pediatricians in the emergency room, nurses, firemen, EMTs, they all have it. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers have a very difficult time in their profession. We have a very high rate of suicide, drug addiction, and alcoholism. And it's due to vicarious trauma of what we do every day. People ask me every day, how I do this, and I'll tell you why I do it and how I do it. We're successful. We have more better outcomes than we do bad outcomes. And it's because we've, we focus on evidence-based systems that we know will work for the children and families when they come in. Now, in addition to be a trauma-informed court, one of the innovative things we've been able to do in a relationship with the University of Tennessee School of Medicine is we have opened the Center for Health and Justice Involved Youth. It is currently in its research stage. It's headed up by a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Altha Stewart. And we refer children and families to the Center for Health and Justice Involved Youth because they're doing long-term research on the brain and epigenetics and how we might be able to fix the problem down the road. I have to believe what the good doctor said, that epigenetics is a solution to all our world's problems, because that's what the Center for Health and Justice Involved Youth is looking at. But from a judge who's been doing this for 20 years, I can tell you the reason I go to work every day is because I know I can make a difference. The systems that are in place, if we use federal funding wisely, and expand those systems throughout the communities like they're doing at the program at Georgetown. Think about the money we can save. Just think about the money we can save. Ruined lives cost money in the long run. If we focus on fixing the problem in the beginning, we're going to save money on the back. Right? So whether you're a Republican, an Independent, or a Democrat, if you're going to save money, you're going to get attention. And you're going to save lives. Thanks. Wow. Um, thank you so much for those moving remarks. Dr. Wright is going to have to leave, so we won't have time for questions for him. But before I open it up to a couple questions, just want to kind of wrap up the themes that were here that we heard about this truly American problem, not just for one community. And I love the way that you put this kind of around the three E's of trauma. Thinking about the event, so Dr. Wright, as well as Dr. Kaminsky, showed us you know, the physiological impacts of the event. The experiences were so visit, viv, vividly described when you showed us the various faces of ACES Con. I mean, literally putting the faces to the names, where we looked at not just the effects of child abuse and neglect, but also opioid abuse, and how our system systematically traumatize individuals when we have to bounce back and forth. I think, you know, what the judge spoke to about, you know, that, that term you used, let her brain mature a wee bit. 
is so powerful. Um, because what we're really talking about is the, re the re dramatic results that you mm -hmm. saw in front of you of just providing the supports mm -hmm. and the si throughout the systems to, in order to give her the buffers that she needed to grow, just that little window of time. And remember what we showed you, both Dr. Kaminsky as well as our, my graphic, on the effects of the brain. So just giving her enough time for those branches to grow, quite literally. Mm -hmm had the dramatic effect. So it, when we think about the, the, uh, the Trauma-Informed Care for Children and Families Act, you know, these, I think all of our panelists here today did a really good job of helping you understand why this legislation is so important for us to identify these best practices, disseminate the best practices, train our key stakeholders around trauma-informed care, testing the new models that many of the programs that um, SAMHSA has promoted and um, funded, as well as in expanding our treatment capacity. And I think, you know, the example that you gave us about, you know, the, the, the young lady who was bounced from mental health care to substance abuse, and neither one of the systems were willing to take her. I think that really helps us to reinforce that reason why we need to have much more coordinated systems. And then fostering the community um, coordination and it's actually George Washington University, not Georgetown, but there's no crosstown rivalry there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the program that we're doing at GW is extremely important in helping us to think about how we bridge healthcare and community resources and other sectors together. So I want to thank again for uh, Dr. I mean, for uh, Senators Heitkamp, Durbin, and Al Franken for their continued support and advocacy around this, this work and all of the sponsors for today's talk. Uh, because this is such a truly American health problem, American community problem, that we have all of the resources we can to bring to bear to this um, if we just work together collaboratively and smarter. Um, I'll have, we have just like a, a minute maybe for two questions, if there are some questions from the audience. I think we wowed them. We gave them, we left them speechless. <laughs> yes, Elizabeth. Well, we are over time. Some of us will be here a little later for additional questions if you'd like to have some. But thank you so much for coming today.